This section is, um, I'm afraid, is a bad news section in a way. We're talking in this section about anti avoidance rules. So we've talked a lot, we've touched on most of these as we've gone through the presentations over the past one and a half days anyway, but we're just drilling down into these in a lot more detail. So we talked about different opportunities for structuring things to get the best possible uh, tax efficiency and the best possible tax outcome for any of the businesses that are advising. So we looked at different things that we could do. We've talked about different things that you need to be careful about. For example, making sure that we really have substance surrounding the arrangement. For example, making sure that we have beneficial ownership of, of money that's passing through different, uh, different entities. But we also need to be aware about specific anti-avoidance rules that are available uh, to governments in domestic legislation and that increasingly will figure in double tax treaties as well as a result of the BEPS actions that I was alluding to just before the break. And that's what this section is about. So this section is sort of another bad news section where we're saying all those lovely things we want to do. These are the rules that probably prevent us doing some of those, or at the very least, we need to be aware of to make sure that we can do the things that we've talked about doing. OK? So what we're going to talk about is different ways in which governments can limit the tax benefit of some of the structuring that we've been touching on over the past couple of days. And some of these are things which might apply through double tax treaties. Some of them might apply through domestic law. Uh, and some of them might apply through international law. Some of them might apply all, altogether differently. So we will be looking at um, a way in which treaty benefits can be limited uh, and actually a way in which other benefits, even under domestic laws, can be limited by the application of something called the principal purpose test. Uh, but the reason we're using that terminology, principal purpose test, is that appears in the BEPS actions in relation to double tax treaties. And the suggestion in the BEPS actions is that the double tax treaty should include a principal purpose test to make sure that you're not just setting something up purely to avoid tax. Um, we'll then look at ways in which the benefit that you could otherwise derive from a double tax treaty can be restricted and can be restricted by limiting the benefit to only apply to certain specific situations or to certain specific entities. If you like a limitation of liability clause, um, like the ones you might put in the letters of engagement, to mean that the maximum that it can ever be paying out, the maximum tax benefit is going to be capped so that the scope for exploiting that and using it in broader circumstances is limited. That's a, that's a logical approach in many ways. You'd expect that there are definitions in any double tax treaty and you'd expect the definitions only to extend to certain entities in certain situations. So that's just really a step on from that. Um, I'll talk about what might be around the corner and what we can expect to see uh, in the years to come because this is going to become an increasingly tough area and the direction of travel is for governments all over the world to tighten up on the ways in which tax law can be interpreted, in which tax law can be applied to different commercial situations to mean that a tax benefit can accrue to anybody. That's a general direction of travel and you're going to see that reflected in lots of legislation and uh, international and domestic. Um, and I'll cover some other key anti-avoidance rules, including, I mean, I'll touch on, using our domestic example is quite useful because, as I've mentioned before, we do have a general anti-abuse rule, as it's termed, um, in UK tax legislation. And that's actually a good yardstick by which to measure how you'd imagine pretty much any rule will apply or won't apply. And I'd like to get some conversation going about, you know, what are the limitations on any of these rules as we were doing before the break? How effective are these rules really in limiting the kind of planning that we're talking about? And the answer is probably not nearly as effective as the taxing authorities would like to think. Because all of this, in avoidance, it is always a trade-off. You want rules by which people can live their lives and they can be certain that they are this side, the correct side of the dividing line. But at the same time, you don't want them to exploit things so that they are deliberately that side of the dividing line. If you leave them in a place where they have no idea which side of the dividing line they are, then you lose way more than the tax take. Uh, economies go down the pan 
because trade just becomes impossible. So it's always a trade-off, and the courts recognise that, and that is an important principle. Um, just like I said before the break, I'm going to charge you all 20 quid if you do stuff, and you all got really annoyed because you didn't know what stuff was. Uh, governments generally don't take that approach, not because they want to be nice necessarily, just because economies can't function in that environment. You need rules, you need some degree of certainty. So there are limitations on the effectiveness of any anti-avoidance any anti uh, measure. <clears throat> okay. Um, oh, I nearly had a graphic there. There you go. People have been trying to find ways of avoiding tax. In other words, uh, legitimately not paying tax for years and years. Can you remember the definitions that we looked at yesterday? What was worse than tax avoidance? What was the one above? Aggressive tax avoidance. Uh, aggressive tax avoidance, thank you very much. That's entirely right. What was the one right at the top of the tree? Or the bottom of the tree, depending on how you view it? Evasion. Evasion, thank you very much. And very important, I know you all know this, but it's important to remind you, Evasion defines something that is illegal. And evasion's easy, you just don't pay it, and then you do your time in jail, and then you get back on the, out on the streets where you can dig up wherever you hid all that money that you saved by not paying your tax. This is not a recommendation. Um, avoidance is the legal non-payment of tax by structuring your affairs in a way that means that you don't pay some tax. And just think about this for a moment, because lots of people get confused about this, because we always hear lots of commentary and lots of people getting very upset about arrangements that are put in place to reduce tax. But think about what tax is. Tax is a unique situation we find ourselves in, isn't it? Uh, you are born in a particular country, and like, like it or lump it, disagree with the policies of the government or agree with them, you have to pay tax. It's a bit like walking into a shop and them saying, like, you are buying this at this price and you've got no choice in the matter. Yes, you can emigrate from some countries, not every country. Uh, but it's, uh, I once, um, uh, don't quote, quote me on this, but one of my colleagues at the Treasury described tax as legalised robbery. Interesting view for a civil servant, uh, but that was the view of one of the not particularly extreme individuals at the Treasury. It is a unique thing. You have no choice in tax. It isn't a system that's asking you to participate if you think it's a good thing or a bad thing. Now, that's fine. And obviously, economies, uh, social security systems, uh, pension systems can't operate without there being an effective tax system. Everybody knows that. But because there's that obligation on citizens and there isn't a choice on citizens, getting certainty about how the rules work is important, isn't it? And if actually anything could apply, and if actually there is no scope, for people to make choices about how they organise their affairs, then that's also potentially damaging. So it's not as black and white as people might make out. That's all I want people to be aware of. And so for that reason, tax avoidance, structuring your affairs so that you pay less tax than you might otherwise do, not only has it been around forever, ever since tax has been around, um, but uh, it isn't necessarily the evil that some people might think it to be. There can be different views, and I'm not putting forward a view. I'm just saying it's not black and white. And like I say, it's been around forever. Does everyone recognize that phrase? It's uh, a, a, a not a, a, most people, English is not your first language, but there is a, uh, if you don't know this, you now know it, daylight robbery. Do you know that phrase, daylight robbery? Um, it's daylight robbery. That means if you go into a shop and you see something is on sale for 100 quid and you think it should be 50 quid, and you say, oh, it's terrible, it's daylight robbery. And I always thought that meant it's daylight robbery. It's somebody robbing me in daylight. So I'm coming over and I'm just pinching your banana. And everyone can see I'm pinching your banana. I didn't even have the courtesy to wait until it was dark before I pinched your banana. I just came along and took it in broad daylight or, and artificial light. That isn't actually what the phrase comes from. It comes from this. It comes from, oops, sorry, I should have had that one. It comes from the window tax. Is everyone familiar with the window tax? Anybody outside the UK, this may be news to you. Um, there was a tax on windows in the UK. <laughs> in fact, if ever I want to make a joke to my colleagues about being out of date with latest tax developments, uh, I often say to them a phrase which most of them don't get. I'm busy at the moment. I'm still dealing with one of those window tax cases that we've got. The implication is I'm very old and I've got very out of date with the tax system because the UK tax system used to include a window tax. And it worked like this. 
the more windows you had on a building, the more tax you paid. There was a tax charge that was linked to how many windows you had. And technically, do you know what that was supposed to be a tax on? It was a tax on daylight. Uh, so the more daylight you wanted, the more tax you had to pay. I'm not making this up. This is, inter this is factual. You can check it out. Uh, Google it after this if you don't believe me. Um, so have a look at this building here. Look at that. What's that about? What do you think people did? Because this is a genuine example, by the way. What do you think people did when this tax was introduced? They bricked up their windows. So they had to pay less window tax. And they therefore legitimately avoided paying window tax by the simple measure of having fewer windows. Entirely legitimate. Nothing anybody could do about it. Um, nothing that taxing authorities could do about it because the tax was levied based on I've got to say, I'm not exactly sure based on what I'm guessing. It was based on, sorry, I'm um, having a few slide problems. I think it was based on either the number of windows or possibly the square footage of windows that you had, but it was based broadly on the more windows you got, the more tax you paid. So people, you, we do have buildings now in London and elsewhere that do have bricked up windows that are still a remnant of that attempt uh, to, to, uh, to avoid tax. Has anyone come across that before? Is everyone, everyone familiar with that or no one familiar with that? Is that news to people? Okay, so there you go. There's an early, uh, early way of people avoiding tax. And there have been various judgments over the years. These are UK judgments I'm going to be referring to here. There have been various judgments over the years that's, that indicate that the courts don't necessarily take a dim view, don't necessarily take a dim view of people structuring their affairs so that they pay less tax. Anyone may so arrange his affairs her affairs, that his, her taxes shall be as low as possible. He, she is not bound to choose that pattern which will best pay the treasury. There is not even a patriotic duty to increase one's taxes. Uh, that, was a, that was a judge speaking in 1934. Um, and that's a principle that is still in existence in UK tax law. You don't have to work out which is the way that gives you the most tax. And that's actually an important principle because there are lots of ways in which you could make your tax take worse. So for example, if you happen to have one of the structures we were talking about involving a Dutch company, um, if you've got a commercial, if you've got a very good commercial reason for having that, you're not forced to abandon it just because another route in, uh, means that more tax goes to different countries' treasuries. Yeah. That's not the only judge uh, that said something along those lines. Um, you've got this judgment as well. And this is taken from a very famous case in the UK, the Duke of Westminster, around about the same time. It was just two years later, as you can see. And the Duke of Westminster, um, the, the, there are successive Dukes of Westminster, but the Duke of Westminster is owner of huge tracts of land in the UK, including huge areas of London, uh, and remains to, be, that remains to this day. And the estate of the Duke of Westminster has had huge tax bills, but lower tax bills than it might otherwise have had because of some quite inventive tax planning. And this is quite an interesting judgment as well. Every man is entitled, if he can, to order his affairs so that the tax attaching under the appropriate tax is less than it otherwise would be. That's kind of the terminology I've been using, isn't it? Talks about tax being less than it otherwise might be. If he succeeds in ordering them so as to secure this best result, then however unappreciative the commissioners of inland revenue, the commissioners of inland revenue uh, are now called a tribunal. They're the judges, first level of judges who look at any, um, look at any, um, any particular tax point that goes to court. Or his fellow taxpayers may be of his ingenuity. He cannot be compelled to pay an increased tax. That again is a principle that still exists under UK law and something similar exists in most, in lots of other jurisdictions that you can't necessarily before, you're not, you're not under an obligation to work out how to pay the most tax. And if you've got a good commercial way of doing things and that results in less tax than something else, then that's still acceptable. And when you think about it, that is, that's only common sense because if you take it to the other extreme, none of us would ever be out of court, would we? Uh, because you could always find ways of meaning that you are less, that you don't qualify for certain beliefs, that you sell businesses in ways that produce more tax, that you structure international arrangements where there's more tax. There'd be no end to it. So it's a logical, it's not a controversial thing, it's actually a logical position.
Hmm. <laughs> now, sorry, I'm afraid there's an awful lot of words on this slide. I'm not going to go through all of that, um, but there is an important point coming from this. This is from some OECD commentary. It's, fact, it's a fact of modern life that when the tax rates in one state are lower than another, certain taxpayers will try to access that lower ta the lower tax rate. Can anybody read out the next four words, please? in an artificial manner. And that's an important point, that the objection to any tax authorities about what we're doing is not that something is being structured that means that you end up with a lower tax rate. It's that it's done in an artificial manner. What's an artificial manner? You'd imagine that's a pretty good, pretty good starting point, isn't it? If your purpose is just to avoid tax, then that's artificial. Uh, probably isn't enough under most current domestic laws to mean that you would be caught by an anti-avoidance rule. Uh, there are specific anti-avoidance rules that have motive tests, and that's what the BEPS, uh, the BEPS um, actions are trying to encourage governments to introduce, and to introduce that into double tax treaties, a principal purpose test. Do you have a principal purpose that is saving tax? Um, so you'd imagine that would indicate artificiality, but not necessarily, not necessarily, because you know it might be that yeah you're doing it to avoid tax, but actually it's the it's the most logical thing in the world, and it just fit just happens to fall nicely. And if you just happen, if serendipity means that you happen to be in a situation where you can use a particular avenue, is it artificial? I don't know, possibly not. So I would, um, I would um, uh, just stress that, that really the focus is on um, artificial arrangements. And look at the language as well later on. Um, taxpayers may be tempted to abuse the tax laws of the state by exploiting differences between various countries' laws. Such attempts may be countered by provisions of jurisprud jurisprudential rules, law, uh, that are part of the domestic law of the state concerned, such a state is then unlikely to agree to provisions of bilateral double tax conventions that would have the effect of allowing abusive transactions. What that's saying is, if you have arrangements, if you have the possibility for people to abuse the tax laws of a state by exploiting differences, what does that mean? Don't know. But if, the, if you have that possibility, then it's expected that states will be introducing domestic rules that mean that any planning along those lines, any attempt at exploiting the rules in that way will be defeated by an, anti, an appropriate anti-avoidance rule and that you would echo that in any bilateral double, uh, double tax treaty that you enter into. You would echo it by having the same rule written into it or the rules of the double tax treaty would be subject to the application of whatever anti-avoidance rule it is that you've introduced domestically. Okay. That it did change. <clears throat> and I will just um, mention a little bit about um, the, what we have in the UK. And I have touched on this uh, before, but it is, it's a good study in the limitation of these kind of rules and how do you go about applying these rules because it's a trade-off. On the one hand, you want it to be really broad, don't you? And you want it to catch everything. But on the other hand, you don't want it to be so broad that it's unenforceable. So it's a trade-off. Which way do you go? And do you remember the example before, before the break? I don't like stuff, and if any stuff goes on, there's a penalty. That's just too broad. It's unenforceable because it could mean anything. What court is going to stand behind that? Uh, on the other hand, if it's too specific, it invites avoidance. So if I say, for example, look, I don't want anybody bringing a drink into this room uh, and putting it on the table because uh, I, don't want, I, don't want people, I don't want to see any drinks on these tables. So you all come in and you put the drink on the floor. And you say, well, that's fine. You didn't mention the floor. You only mentioned the table. So we're not breaching the rule, are we? So there's your trade-off. Do you have something very, very general that catches everything or do you have something more specific that opens the possibility of it being circumvented? And in the UK, they've gone for something which I think is very, very clever uh, but possibly not that effective in the longer term. Uh, they've gone for something that's ambiguous. Um, so we don't know how it applies. Nobody in the UK knows 
how the general anti-abuse rule applies. It's called general anti-abuse rule, so there's an implication that the rule would only be applied to something that is abusive. And if you're doing something that you know, is basically commercial but actually gets you a tax advantage, then possibly not. But that's only the name. It doesn't say anything in that. Has anyone here read the general, anti, uh, the general anti-abuse rule? We have one hand up, which is all I'd expect, really, uh, certainly because I think we've only got three people from the UK here. Um, so uh, if anybody outside the UK had read the UK general anti-abuse rule, I would have been particularly impressed or horrified, I'm not sure which. Um, the general anti-abuse rule broadly works like this. It says, and I'll give you, um, this isn't verbatim, but I'll give you a flavour of what the, what the, um, uh, how it works. It talks about um, where it would be reasonable uh, to conclude that the outcome that you've got, taking into account all the relevant tax position, provisions, is not a reasonable outcome, then the rule can apply. Well, what on earth does that mean? What's reasonable and what is unreasonable? And why have they gone for that route? Because that's almost a bit like my thing about the stuff. And so it's very, very broad. And so there's real doubts about how that would apply to anything. And it hasn't so far been applied to anything. And it's been around four years. But what does it do? What does it actually achieve, can anyone think? It's there. It's not actually been applied. What does it achieve? Yeah, it's a deterrent. Every time we talk to a client about doing anything, can we set up that offshore company? Can we set up that subsidiary? Can we transfer that asset from that company to that company? Can we do this reorganization? We all look at each other in a panic and go, does the GAR apply to this? And nobody knows. So what do we do? We write to HMRC and ask them if they'll give a view on it. And they say they don't comment on the GAR. So that doesn't get us anywhere. You can actually get a comment out of them sometimes because they will comment on what they consider to be genuine commercial arrangements. And if it's a genuine commercial arrangement, then it's difficult to see how it would be caught by the GAR. But actually, on the wording of the GAR, it could be caught. So it's ambiguous. But that's a route that the UK have decided to go down. And that isn't stupidity. That's deliberate. It's, um, it's basically something that's there as a big, scary shadow but no one actually quite knows what it is. I once described it, does everyone know the film The Wizard of Oz? Uh, a a, a cross-cultural reference, hopefully. The Wizard of, in The Wizard of Oz, there's the, there's the magician uh, at the end of the film, isn't there? He's standing behind the curtain, and there's a big booming voice coming out. And when you pull back the curtain, he's just a little guy like this, and he's not very frightening at all. And when he's hidden behind the curtain, there's a big scary voice coming out. He's terrifying. Once you try to apply the guy and it doesn't work, it's not terrifying anymore. Um, you've pulled back the curtain and you've revealed he's only a little guy like that. Um, I'm quite little, actually, a little guy like that. Um, so, uh, and he's not frightening at all. Um, so that's the route that the UK tax authorities have chosen. So general anti-abuse rules, anti-avoidance rules, how effective are they? Nobody really knows, but that's partly the point. As a deterrent, they can be quite effective in just stopping people ever trying the stuff in the first place. There are um, three recommended things that could be going into tax treaties, three recommended ways in which governments, when they're concluding tax treaties, might look at ensuring that they're not abused. So these are in the BEP sections. The first is a general anti-abuse clause, uh, or a bona fide provision clause or a principal purpose of test. Um, now, of those, like I say, I think that's, that's your scary deterrent one. I think that's just something there to scare advisors off using these kind of things. Uh, the bona fide provision of the principal purpose test is probably a little more targeted and is a little more effective. That's really saying, as we said, uh, as, 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 we, uh, as was suggested from the front here, if you ask the question, were you just doing this to save tax? Was a, normally a principal purpose of this to save tax, then you don't achieve what you're going to get. Um, a specific anti-abuse clause, or a targeted anti-abuse clause, or a TAR, as it's sometimes referred to, is, as the name suggests, something that isn't as general in application. It's intended to apply to specific circumstances, and for that reason, it's likely to be more effective. Because the targeted anti-avoidance rule can talk about very specific circumstances. So, for example, it can talk about a conduit company. And it can put it into legislation. 
that a conduit company, so a target sensitive audience will might go like this. It might say a conduit company shall be taken not to have a beneficial ownership of money unless it retains that money or uh, some equivalent to it for a period of 12 months or more. It might say that. That's a targeted anti-avoidance rule. It's quite specific in its remit and quite specific in its ambition and generally, therefore, much more enforceable than the general anti-abuse clause. And limitation of benefits clause is just really where you're finding a way to say, look, we don't want, any, we don't want you dreaming up any arrangement that benefits from these from these withholding tax rates. We want you only getting the benefit of these withholding tax rates where it's a quoted company or where it's a company that's carrying on this, uh, this particular activity or where it's limited to this particular amount of tax. And that is, that's, uh, that's kind of cast iron. A limitation of, well, as far as any tax law is cast iron, uh, that's a way of putting something very concrete in the treaty that you can't really see any way around. There's no ambiguity in that. Everyone see the difference between those, yeah? So we've got deliberately ambiguous but scary. Uh, we've got a much more targeted but narrow in what it actually does. And we've got very targeted, uh, quite narrow in what it does, uh, but concrete in its result. Okay. Mm, right, okay. Okay, these are a couple of um, examples of the kind of things that appear in treaties to help the treaty be applied in a way that can't be, can't be exploited. Um, so you might have, for example, in the commentary to Article 1 in the OEC model convention, it's saying that um, you can specify that the treaty, look, we're entering into this treaty... We're not doing that so that people can avoid or evade tax. We're doing that so that we're freeing up liberating trade. And we're doing that so that there are economic benefits coming out of this. And if, anybody, if either member state thinks it's being used in a way that is counter to that objective, contrary to that objective, then they can introduce their own provisions to counter that. Um, and this is also what can be going into the preamble or into, uh, into, the early, into the definition parts of a double tax treaty. Where a main purpose for entering into certain transactions or arrangements is to secure a more favourable tax position. And that's, uh, that's contrary to the objective or purpose of the relevant provisions of the Convention, then the treatment under the provision could be denied if you include a clause like that. So countries are being, uh, being encouraged to include a clause that has, as we've got referred to here, a main purpose test. Now, one thing to note there, those tests always talk about a main purpose, not the main purpose. And that makes it harder to get around the provision, doesn't it? Because if it says the main purpose of doing something, then provided you've got another main purpose, We've got a, a big, uh, some of the big purpose that could be the main purpose, then you're probably okay. Where it's a main purpose, that's deliberately more likely to apply. Because the inference from that is that there must be the possibility of there being more than one main purpose. And if there are lots of purposes, then if any of them, if you line all the different purposes of the arrangement up and one of them is saving tax, then you could still be caught by this. Question though for everybody, can you have more than one main purpose? Don't you have all your purposes in a line and the one at the front is the main one and the rest are subsidiary purposes? Isn't that by definition? Can you have more than one main purpose? I don't know. I'm not sure you can. So I'm not sure the wording actually works. To be honest, I know what they're getting at. Um, they're getting at one of the, and in a lot of UK legislation, we have the terminology, uh, the main purpose or one of the purposes. Um, but I'm not, I, I don't know if you can have more than one main purpose. Uh, one of the purposes has got to be the main one, hasn't it? Um, otherwise, I think, I don't know, maybe you could have three main purposes and six subsidiary ones. I don't know. Um, but you only need to be, that's their intention, they're trying to get to that, but I don't know how effective that is. But the idea is by using the indefinite article rather than the definite article, using a uh rather than the, 
uh, they're trying to get at the idea that they, there could be lots of main purposes and only one of them has got to be, tax has only got to be, saving tax has only got to be one of them for this provision to apply. <coughs> Mm. Okay. Okay, so here's a question for you. Let's say we have got that main purpose test. Let's say we've got a double tax treaty and it says, look, you don't get the benefit of these 0% withholding taxes unless if uh, the A main purpose of the arrangement is saving tax. Let's say that's what we've got. What we've got. Think about our situation here. Think about the USA company, which is paying interest up to the Dutch company, the Dutch finance company, and the Dutch finance company is paying interest onto the Saudi company. Okay, is a main purpose saving tax? Yes, yes or no? Uh, I've, got, I've got three yeses so far, and if I include your yes with your no, then I've got four yeses four and a no. no. Okay. Okay, yeah. <laughs> What do we think? So the general consensus would be that a main purpose is there. Is there anything you can do about that? By the way, I'm not sure that's right. And I'm not sure that's right. It might be right. Depends on the circumstances. But remember, it's a main purpose. Um, is it a purpose or is it an outcome? And the question here is, can you have sufficient commercial rationale? Is there sufficient commercial reason, apart from tax, for having a company in Holland that acts as your treasury company? And I may call on our colleagues at the back of the room to start shouting out what they think. Uh, so, so you can start selling your services here, guys. Uh, why should we all be setting up finance companies in Holland? And actually, when you look at it, there can be some quite good compelling reasons for why setting up a finance company in Holland for a multinational group actually works really very well. And if it makes your business work better and it makes you more likely that you're going to produce 100 in profit rather than not producing profit overseas, if it makes that more likely, then tax can't be the main purpose, can it? Because tax is only ever a rate. Tax is only ever a percentage of that profit. And if it's actually helping you produce the profit, then it's not the main purpose. By the way, that isn't just my comment. That's, lots of people have made that comment. That, that's, the nature of tax means that when you're talking about the main purpose, if something actually is producing a genuine commercial outcome, then it can be uh, tax automatically, just because it is only a rate, can't be the main purpose. Remember, they've tried to make that tougher by talking about one of the main purposes, but we don't know exactly what that means. We don't even know if you can have more than one main purpose. Let's assume you can. What would be the commercial rationale? Why might we have a Dutch finance company? And I'd like everyone to shout out any thoughts they have on this. Why might we have a Dutch finance company? Why, why might it be useful? What might it do for us? <laughs> See if I can get any words on this board at all. And if I can't get any, then we can't do it, can we? Uh, because we know what the main purpose is. It's that withholding tax rate. What have we got? Who can suggest something? Can I be able to earn more interest or more finance income? Okay. Um, okay. Interest income. Great. Okay. We've got one, thank God. Any more? Keep them coming. Uh, it's, it's, I was with you all the way up to the word taxes. Uh, Try to think of anything non-tax related that would be a reason really for, um, for, uh, for having the finance company there. 
Yeah, great. Okay. It's a bit like it's, it's the flip side of banking costs. It's actually access to finance. So, you know, the banking system might be such that actually getting loans on really favourable terms, which will be a bigger one than the banking costs, actually. Sorry. Uh, getting loans on favourable terms might be, um, uh, might be uh, dramatically facilitated. Keep them coming. Excuse my handwriting. Any more? Oh, I like that one. That was financial specialist. So can I put down expertise? Fine expertise. Forgive me, there was one from the front row. Oh no, feel confident, feel confident. Yeah, love it. That's actually a huge one. Um, where, you, where you're setting, it really is, where you're setting up, um, uh, and I've got to say that the, the UK, I've got to be, I mean, look at what's happening in the UK with Brexit. You know, I mean, this is, this is enormous, and companies are making, they're spending billions on looking at relocation. Mm. You know, these aren't little decisions they make. Why? Uh, because they're worried about the access to European markets. The, in, the, in the bigger picture, these things are huge. I just want to make a point when we get to the end of this. Anything else? That's, that's, that's pretty good, actually, guys. Well done. Is there any, anybody, anyone got anything else? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I suppose that what you're thinking, I mean, ultimately you will, by, by taking advantage of these, you will have, you, you'll have a grossing up, you'll have a roll up uh, advantage, won't you? So you are, you know, you are even putting aside tax and you can tell I'm trying to steer clear of tax in any of these conclusions, in any of these points, but you still, with getting the benefit of all of these, you are basically producing a bigger, bigger, you know, bigger investment pool. So yeah, we'll put it, we'll phase it that. So more... More for investment. Okay. Oops. Well, I'll get this. I'll get a photo done of this and just sent on to you so this can go with your slides. Um, all I'd like people to think about is um, this isn't this isn't rubbish. This isn't just flannel. This isn't just kind of stuff you come up with to try and put the tax man off the scent. Uh, these are real. And when you add up these benefits, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I've never worked in banking, I've never worked in a treasury function. If you get the right treasury expertise dealing with the money that's in the Dutch company, the difference that will make to the wealth of this company goes beyond the tax it's going to be saving by doing this. If you get the right access to EU markets and you're able to win contracts in countries where you'd otherwise really struggle because being competitive when you've got to add on add on the extra duties you're putting onto the prices you're charging them if you can actually go through you uh, if, if, through an eu base in accessing those markets that's going to make a huge difference to your business which is going to dwarf the value of the tax saving these are genuine things and you add them up and they do outweigh the tax saving now viewed in that context the Dutch company we got there is not a controversial thing, if all these are real. If, the, if we just put them down the list, because I've got the tax man coming around tomorrow, and I don't want him to, to send us a big bill, if I'm just trying to convince somebody, and I'm just making this up, then no, this doesn't count for anything. If these are real, then I think it makes it very, very difficult for anyone to say that a main purpose of the arrangement is to get advantage of the double tax treaty provisions. And that's the key to anything we're doing. And I've said this several times. It, if we're doing anything for people, if you've got something that's commercial, that's perfect. And as professional advisors, that's really how we should be thinking all the time. Start off with the commerciality. And yeah, we happen to know about the tax system, but you know, don't be too hard in pushing the tax system. Once you've got the commercial drivers and what people want to do and where they want to get to, then you can look at whether you go that way or you go that way. Uh, to do it. Once somebody's come up with the idea they want a finance company overseas, then where is it going to be is a different question. 
Now, for that, you can legitimately choose a low-tax jurisdiction rather than a, uh, rather than a high-tax jurisdiction. Nothing wrong with that at all, provided that isn't at the cost of a whole load of other commercial benefits by having it in high-tax jurisdiction. And finance companies are a really good example of this because generally you'll find if you set up a Dutch finance company, uh, lots of multinational groups will find they've got something that will do an awful lot for them way beyond the taxes that they're saving. And because it will do a lot for them way beyond the taxes that they're saving, the taxes that they're saving is just a bonus. And when it's in that context, none of these rules that we're talking about in anti-avoidance bother us at all. Everybody see that, yeah? Simple enough, really, and it's back to basic principles. But, you know, this is, it's, it's very much genuine. Well, Yeah, um, no, that, that's, I think that's a, that's a perfectly good reason. I mean, I think, you know, the, the comment on the front was, could you, uh, I'm afraid I'll use your terminology, could we create an even fluffier reason? I love the word fluffier. I should use it more in conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, to indicate, to set up a finance company in Holland, just really for kudos reasons, just say, look at us, look how we're set up. That's genuine. And that goes... I mean, that goes back to, you know, stuff that we do with clients on a totally different level. Where you're on about, um, you know, if you've anyone that's advised um, owner-manager businesses or anyone that's advised small business, often a reason for incorporating is it just looks better when you've got a company. And a reason for VAT registering, even though you may be below the threshold, looks better if you've got a VAT registration number. And actually, that adds an awful lot to your income because the people you're dealing with take you seriously. So, no, it's perfectly good, perfectly good reason. In fact, I will add it. <laughs> I don't know how to make these letters look fluffy, so I'll just write them. Okay. <laughs> Can I call it kudos? Is that all right? Okay. Um, it means I have to write less. Uh, and I think that, that covers the point. Everyone get that one, yeah? Um, so, you know, it can just be nice to show to the world that you're a really serious player uh, by having that entity. And that's quite, that's quite a good... That's quite a good thing. Now, um, this is a limitation of benefits clause. And we've talked about this before. So we've talked about, so far, general anti-avoidance rules and how they might apply to something like this. We've said that the general anti-avoidance rule, the general anti-abuse rule, yeah, uh, can be a big, big scary thing, can be a big uncertain thing, can be a great deterrent. How effective is it? How easy is it to apply in practice? Not so sure. But a limitation of benefits clause it's much easier to apply in practice because you can just definitely make sure that it works. Um, if anybody wants to have a quick read of that down to the bottom there, then I'll flick on to the next page and then we'll cover the next one and then I'll be asking you questions. Okay, um, I won't pick on anybody. Let's try and pick this, let's try and work out what this is doing. Except as well, otherwise provided in this article, a resident of a contracting state shall not be entitled to the benefits of this convention otherwise accorded to residents of a contracting state unless such resident is a qualified person. So, who's the only type of person that gets the benefits under this? What are they called? A qualified person, yeah. In other words, they're saying, and they, this is what legislation always does, you throw up a definitional term like that and then afterwards that's all you're looking out for. So in other words, put that into, put that into basic English. Look, you only get this... You only get the benefits of this if you're a qualified person, right? And we all then say, well, what's a qualified person? Glad you asked me that because I'm about to tell you what a qualified person is. And that's how the treaty works. It says a resident for contracting sake shall be a qualified person for a taxable year. If the resident is an individual, we're talking about a company, so it's not an individual. Ignore B. A company, if the principal class of its shares and any disproportionate class of shares is regularly traded on one or more uh, recognised stock exchanges and either its principal class of shares is primarily traded on one or more recognised stock exchanges located in the contracting state in which the company is resident or the company's primary place of management and control is in the contracting state in which it is resident. What sort of companies qualify for these benefits would you say? Anybody else? We've had the correct answer from the front, by the way. I'm seeing if anyone else can come up with it. What's a company got to be to qualify for these benefits under that limitation of liability clause? Some stock exchange. 
Thank you. Yeah, you were beaten to it actually by the lady at the front. Uh, but you said it very quietly. That gave me the opportunity to see if anyone else would catch up with you. Uh, it's it's got to be. It's got to be. Qu everyone see it's got to be quoted. Stock's got to be quoted. And there's actually a little anti-avoidance rule in here as well. It says its principal class of shares is primarily traded on one or more recognised stock exchange. We'll have a look at that. So basically, what this limitation of liability clause is saying, it gets a bit more complicated than this in a moment. It's basically saying when you read it through, when you work it through, that only a company whose main stock is listed on a recognised stock exchange and a recognised stock exchange in the contracting state in which the company is resident, um, then uh, that's the only kind of company that gets the benefit of this. So it stops an unquoted company from getting the benefit of these lower rates of withholding tax. Everyone see that? Okay. Can anyone tell me what B means? Little B. A resident of a contracting state shop, this is defining what a qualified person is. And remember, a qualified person is somebody who gets the benefit of this particular provision. A resident of a contracting state shall be a qualified person for the benefit uh, for, the, for a taxable year if the resident is A, an individual, B, a contracting state or a political subdivision of or local authority thereof, C, a company. Ah, we might have it. We might have it. Uh, it might be that, I've uh, just had a suggestion, which is the smartest one I've heard, by the way, uh, is that that could apply to an embassy. Uh, I don't know how an embassy would be getting into these tax charges, I've got to say. Um, how can a contracting state be a resident of a contracting state? How do you do that? Can the UK be a resident of the UK? I'm not aware of that. I have no idea what that means. And I can't for the life of me work it out. If anybody comes up with the answer and can explain what that is, then please let me know. But what I think this indicates is even at this level, even at the uh, level of international law, we have things that creep into treaties that make no sense whatsoever. So go. This may be completely wrong, but could it be, could examples be like where the UK has sovereign basis? Oh, oh, I like it. Uh, it could be, it could be. So it might be like a sovereign territory. Could be. It's just odd though that it calls it a contracting state and it doesn't say a sovereign territory of a contracting state. Or, you know, so I don't know why it says, because it defines contracting state as the two states that are contracting to it. So I don't know, I, I just don't know what it, I don't know what it means. Because I don't know how, because to be a qualified person, you've got to be a resident of the contracting state. And, a re and once you are a resident of the contracting state, that resident of the contracting state shall be a qualified person uh, if, if, if the resident is. A contracting state. And I just don't. I just don't understand how that wording works. Uh, and I've given up trying to work it out. Um, so I've got, you know, life's too short. Uh, but that's probably probably that might be what it's after. But if it is, it's awful wording, isn't it? Yeah. It's really badly worded. And I think um, I think uh, one thing. All I'd say from that is, okay, how's that help us? All I'd say is, remember, these are written by human beings, and they go through processes that human beings are uh, are going through. And you do get thing, odd things creeping in. I've spotted. In UK law, I spot typos and things that are actually wrong and don't work uh, from time to time, and you do get that. Whether that is in that category, I don't know, uh, but it's very, very odd. It goes on, and I just want to show you this just as a, as a sort of introduction to really reading this kind of stuff and getting your head around how you have to read this kind of stuff. But it goes on, defines it further, and it looks a bit odd because it says at least 50% of the aggregate, uh, da, da, yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, the company's prime proposal, or so it's A, B, or C. So it's at least 50% of the aggregate vote and value of the shares, at least 50% of any disproportionate shares of the company is owned directly or directly. Yeah. This appears to suggest that it isn't just a quoted company, because this or says actually, if 50% of the shares are owned by five or fewer participators, uh, then you're within the rule as well. But it does say, I worked it out in the end, is owned directly uh, or indirectly by five or fewer, com uh, five or fewer companies entitled to benefits under Clause 1 of this subparagraph. Remember, it's circular. To be entitled to benefits under Clause 1, you've got to be a quoted company, we've worked out. So if you're not a quoted company, but your shares are owned by five or fewer quoted companies, then you're fine. That's how I worked that out. So that's what that limitation of liability, that limitation of benefits clause is doing. It's working by saying, look, all you get is only these types of companies get the benefit of this and no other companies get the benefit of that. And that's rock solid, apart from the fact it's misdrafted, as we've determined, that's rock solid, isn't it? Because you're either within that definition or you're outside that definition. And if you're outside that definition, you don't get the benefits under the treaty. 
So that's our limitation of liability, a limitation of benefits clause intended to work. It limits it to certain people who can benefit. Everyone happy with that? I, I, I feel that that was a bit complicated asking you to read that and try to get your mind around that. I do understand that, but that is, that is the way that you need to approach these clauses in double tax treaties when you come to, when you come to look at them or advise on them. And by the way, having said all of that, having said all of that, this paragraph three gives a commercial let out. And this will be a common thing in limitation of benefit clauses. They'll say, look, only these kind of people can actually get the benefits. Okay, but, but a resident of a contracting state will be entitled to benefits of the convention with respect to an item of income derived from the state, regardless of whether the resident is a qualified person. There you go, regardless. So you don't need to be a, a, a qualified person all of a sudden. So if you fall within this, you don't need to be a qualified person. So we can forget that stuff we were looking at before if the resident is engaged in the active conduct of a trade or business in the first mentioned state. So if you're carrying on a legitimate trade or a legitimate business, you're not just there as a conduit company, you're not just there as a finance company with no uh, third party transactions going on. If you're there and you're transacting in the open market with third, pers third persons, undertaking a genuine trade or business, you don't need to be a qualified person. That's the sort of model for a limitation of, li a limitation of benefits clause. Everyone see that, yeah? A bit complicated, I know, but when you get your head around it, uh, I won't go through that, when you get your head around it, then the end result is that the, 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 sort of the, the scope of it, the ombit of that clause, the situations in which it applies, you can at least narrow them down to a defined set of circumstances. The only nebulous bit, the only uncertain bit, being if you're relying on this. Because it is it, um, uh, is it engaged in the active conduct or trade of a business? Well, even that's reasonably certain, isn't it? You can generally tell whether you're actually carrying on an active trade or business. Uh, but that's the only point of uncertainty if you're relying on that. Otherwise, it's pretty, it's pretty clear what, which entities will benefit from it and which won't. I'm not, that's just the concluding parts of that limitation of benefit clause, and I'm not going to go through that. This, on this limitation of benefits clause, you've got linked in a principal pur purpose test. And the principal purpose test might stand on its own as being uh, a thing that denies or allows the relief to be given in the first place. But this is actually linked into the limitation of benefits clause. So in other words, um, the limitation of benefits clause applies. But if you can pass this test, there's no limitation of benefits. If you pass this test, you uh, qualify for the benefits whether you're a qualified person or not. And here you can see this is this principal purpose test that we talked about before. If a resident of a contract state is neither a qualified person pursuant to the provisions of paragraph 2, nor entitled to benefits with respect to an item of income under paragraph 4 of this article, the competent authority or the contracting state may nevertheless grant the benefits as conventional benefits with respect to a specific item of income if it determines that the establishment of acquisition da, 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 of its operations does not have what was one of its principal purposes, the obtaining of benefits under this convention. In other words, you've got to be a, you've got to be a qualified person as defined before. You don't get the benefits unless you're a qualified person, unless you're carrying on a trade, an active trade or business in the contracting state. We know that. Unless you can demonstrate that the, the reason, the principal purpose, it was not the one of the principal purposes in setting up the arrangement was not to obtain the benefits of the, of the convention, was not to obtain those lower rates of withholding tax. If you can demonstrate that, then you don't need to be a qualified person. So this is an example of something that, it's a limitation of benefits clause, but actually it incorporates a principal purpose test as well to determine whether the limitation of benefits clause applies. And that principal purpose test Will, apply, will appear in treaties on its own as being something that says, look, you don't get the benefits under this treaty unless da 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 Okay? And built into these rules, where you've got a principle, where you've got a limitation of benefits test. Remember, a limitation of benefits test is intended to be quite specific. It's intended to be quite accurate. It's intended to be one way you can be certain that you are an entity because you're a qualified person that gets the benefits of the treaty or that you're not within it because you're not a qualified person as defined there, in which case you've got to worry about whether you fall the right side of that principal purpose test. It's intended to be quite specific. So they do include certain provisions to stop you trying to sidestep 
the rule, and this is one here. Do you remember we said that to be a qualified person under this rule, the company had to have its shares quoted on a recognised stock exchange? Remember that? And it actually said the principal class of shares quoted on the stock exchange. So here's a clever idea. Let's set up a company and we'll call the shares the principal class of shares and we'll call the rest of the shares the ordinary shares, okay? And then we'll list the principal class of shares. But the principal class of shares actually only entitle anybody owning them to one hundredth of a percent of the value of the company. What's wrong with that? This is wrong with that. The principal class of shares means the ordinary or common shares of the company, provided that such class of shares represents the majority of the voting power. That's okay. We could deny them votes. Not, we could give them votes. Not worried about that. Ah, and the value of the company. So if you try to get clever and try to sidestep it by creating a class which you call the principal class, but actually doesn't give any real economic or legal rights to anybody, that doesn't get you around it. What might, what else? I, I, ignore that. If that wasn't there, do we think you could do that anyway? If that clause wasn't there, and we all got our heads together and we said, blimey, listen guys, in order to benefit from the lower, withholding, the lower rate of withholding tax, we've got to have something that's a qualified person. To be a qualified person, it's got to be quoted. And its principal class of shares have got to be quoted on a stock exchange. I know, we'll create something we call the principal class of shares, and that will be the principal class, but all the value will be in the others. Technically, that works, doesn't it? If that clause isn't there, if that, does that work, though? And why doesn't it? Because it doesn't. Why wouldn't that work? What, what is this I'm reading from? It's, a, it's not legislation, what is it? It's a clause in a what? Uh, a treaty, tax treaty. Uh, and how do you read a tax treaty? Purposively. You read it purposively. You look, at, you look at the intention. You look at what people were really trying to do. And come on, principal class of shares? We know what they're after. They want the company to, the company to be quoted. Yeah, they, they, they use the phrase principal class of shares. We know exactly why the legislator has used the word principal, the phrase principal class of shares. They don't want it defeated just because they happen to have a class of shares, a subsidiary class that isn't quoted. They still want to be within the provision. And they're being kind, they're saying, look, you don't have to have all your shares quoted on stock exchange, just your main ones, yeah? If you try to sidestep it by pretending you've, quoted the, you've listed the main ones, when actually all the value is in non-quoted shares, that would be beaten on a purposive, inter on a purposive reading of the, of the rule anyway. So I don't think they needed that extension personally of the, um, of the treaty. I think it's clear enough on a purposive reading that you've got to have a company that's basically quoted. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's got a few shares that are owned, <coughs> held by individual investors or held by pension schemes directly or something like that and not available on the, on the market. <coughs> but its shares basically have got to be on the market and quoted. Okay. On we go nearly there, chaps. <coughs> Okay, so um, I mean, applying applying this to what we were looking at in those in those rules, um, we'd have to ask ourselves if that provision were, were in this double tax treaty. It's not. If that provision were in this double tax treaty, when we instead originally we started with that, didn't we? That if we're paying a dividend from the U.S. to the Saudi company, we have a whopping great thirty percent withholding tax. We don't like that. So instead, we've set up this arrangement whereby we've got <coughs> a dividend going. Um, to uh, the Dutch company and then from the Dutch company to the Saudi company and we reduced it to 5% uh, withholding tax in and out and a little bit of refund in the Dutch company. So we've got a big tax advantage by doing that. If that provision I was looking at were in the double tax treaty, then we'd have to ask ourselves this. Do we have somebody that's a qualified person? If we don't have somebody that's a qualified person and it needs to be a qualified person, then are, have we got a genuine business that's being carried on in Holland? And if we haven't got a genuine business that's being carried on in Holland, we're back to this defence. We, can we say that it wasn't the principal uh, uh, purpose of setting up this, was to save tax? Can we say that the principal purpose in setting this up was something else? Or there were lots of other purposes that add up to be bigger than the principal purpose or to be bigger than the purpose of saving tax? That's the way it would go. And unless, with that provision in the, in the treaty, unless you can get within that, then it's defeated by that provision in the treaty. So you can see that a limitation of benefit clause, although this one does then lean on a, on a, on a principal purpose test, a limitation of benefits clause is probably, 
going to be the most effective in practically denying you the lower rates of tax, the lower rates of withholding tax under a particular treaty. And if we try to do things that are too aggressive, if we try to do things that potentially fall the wrong side of these rules, we've got generally case law that isn't particularly helpful on this, that really says that, you know, um, before any of these rules are even thought about, any of the rules I'm talking about on anti-avoidance, you have got case law suggesting that if somebody is just abusing the provisions of a treaty, then that's potentially damaging for international law as a whole, and therefore you shouldn't be allowed to get away with that, and different cases are pointed to that. The commentary on this does help the courts, and the courts can point to the commentary to defeat arrangements which are blatantly abusive of treaties. They can say, look, why was this treaty set up? It was set up to stop there being a double taxation charge. It was set up to encourage the free movement of trade, uh, the, uh, the free movement of goods, the free movement of labour, the, uh, the opening up of trade between the two countries. That's why it was there. It wasn't set up so you could just pay less tax in this particular way. So uh, the courts will rely on that. So the point here is that irrespective of whether any of those rules are present, irrespective of whether any of those rules are effective, there's a general legal principle that if a treaty is just being abused in a particular way, that it can be, uh, the benefit of that can be denied. As I mentioned, we have different actions in the BEPS agenda, which are to do with stopping there being treaty abuse. And Action 6 in particular, um, everyone's aware that people are just shopping around and people are trying to set up arrangements that just take advantage of favourable lower rates of withholding tax from one jurisdiction to another. Everyone's aware that that's probably the biggest issue that we're facing with international tax and that's the big thing that BEPS needs to, be, uh, needs to address. And in response to that, the anti-abuse provisions in treaties, most countries have agreed that they're going to include a kind of general anti-abuse provision in treaties. As I said, I don't think that's particularly useful in practice. I think that's only useful as a deterrent. I think that's just something that scares people off from using the particular arrangement that they otherwise might use. In reality, getting a court to buy it, getting a court to accept that that is something that means that you can't get the lower rate of withholding tax, I think it's quite tough. Um, but that's the direction of travel, and I think most countries will start adopting general anti-abuse provisions anyway, just because of the deterrent effect of that, if nothing else. And I think that, you know, that it, with, with the presence of a general anti-abuse rule in a treaty, you think twice before doing these kind of things, and you'd want some pretty good legal advice on the application of that and how that is effective or, or isn't effective. A little bit further than that, it's kind of adding on, on to it, but it's, um, uh, I, mean, I mean, this is, um, this is um, again, just to help the courts in coming to the conclusion that the way you should read this, the way you should read the treaty purposefully, is that where it is being used in a way that anybody can see as being abusive, where that can be the case, that it shouldn't apply. And, I mean, this is a bit like the rules about having a general anti-abuse rule or general anti-avoidance rule, but a statement uh, that, you know, they want to avoid creating opportunities to avoid tax. Uh, and that's the, that's the backdrop to the creation of the treaty. That will help courts in coming to a conclusion that something's abusive. Um, and uh, there will be the, the OECD model that you've all got access to through the link on the slides that you're going to be getting. The OECD model will include a suggested general anti-abuse rule or, uh, or an anti-abuse rule. Um, again, like I say, I think that's only, that's a deterrent still. Um, and, but uh, a principal purpose test uh, rule, so this, it's actually a bit more than the general anti-abuse rule, a principal purpose test rule will also be included uh, in the model treaty and that's probably a little bit more powerful. I mean, I think the way the order, like I said, the order of these is general anti-abuse rule, is great deterrent, but because it's so general, probably not that enforceable. A limitation of liability rule, a limitation of benefit rule, rather, is at the other extreme. I think it's very specific, 
And if you're within the definitions, so you, the benefit is limited, then you don't get the benefit absolutely fine. Then the principal purpose test is a bit more than a deterrent. Um, it's probably much more enforceable, but it's somewhere in the middle. Um, but the, in terms of the actions, um, all of those will be things that will be appearing in double tax treaties, and that's what all countries are being encouraged to do. So, that was that action that we were talking about there. That was one of the substance group of actions that we talked about yesterday in terms of the BEPS actions to stop these kind of things going on. But the final action, which does relate to double tax treaties and anti-avoidance in double tax treaties is the multilateral instrument. And that's a BEP action, that's a BEPS action that has been, uh, something has happened with this, there has already been a multilateral instrument that's been drawn up. You can get access to the multilateral instrument and you can have a good old read of it if you really fancy something nice to do this evening, uh, if you're not going for a Japanese meal. Um, and uh, it runs to 48 pages and is pretty dull, um, but it's actually quite important in the advice that we're giving people, let's be honest. Um, the multilateral instrument, this has actually gone on from this, because with this talked about, this is actually from last, I should have actually updated this slide to be entirely honest, I updated the earlier ones and forgot to update this one, uh, because it's saying the same thing. Uh, basically, this is talking about the progress of the multilateral instrument. And can you remember, can any, anybody remember what the multilateral instrument was when I was talking about it yesterday? Can anyone, anyone remind me what this is about? Or does anyone know what it's about? Okay, it's a tough question really, a bit unfair. Uh, but hey, uh, that's what I do. Um, the, uh, the multilateral instrument is intended to be something that it looks a bit like a double tax treaty, in a way. Uh, except it's not. It's not a double tax treaty. It's not a model double tax treaty. But... It is a list of provisions that signatories to the multilateral uh, instrument basically say that will apply to their tax treaties. So when you're reading their tax treaties, you have to look at the multilateral instrument. You have to say, well, actually, here's the tax treaty between the UK and France. But both of them signed up to the multilateral instrument. And both, in signing up to the multilateral instrument, said that Articles 7, 9, 15 and 23 will all apply to their double tax treaties. And one of those articles, for example, is to do with the general anti-abuse rule. And another article in it is to do with the limitation of liability clause. So the multilateral instrument really takes away the need for everybody to go back and renegotiate all their double tax treaties, doesn't it? Because you can say you're layering on top the multilateral instrument and all the provisions in the multilateral instrument that you've opted into also apply to the double tax treaty. So what you actually have to do to work out whether any of those anti-avoidance provisions are present in a double tax treaty or could apply to a double tax treaty, you now have to do several things. You have to look at the domestic law of the two countries involved to see whether they have a general anti-abuse rule or a targeted anti-abuse rule that could apply to what the kind of planning that we're looking at, because that can be used. The UK GAR could be used to defeat the use of a, uh, a Dutch finance company. By the way, I'll put my neck on the block, it won't be. And that's, uh, and nor do I think a general anti-abuse rule in the relevant double tax treaty would apply in that way either. Um, I don't think it would apply to it, because I don't think under the terms of the GAR, you're doing anything that it is not reasonable to believe that you've got a reasonable outcome. I think the outcome is perfectly reasonable. The, um, but the domestic law is the first thing you need to look at. Then you have to look at the double tax treaty to work out whether there's any general anti-avoidance rule, whether there's any limitation of benefits rule, or whether there's any targeted anti-avoidance rule within the double tax treaty that could apply to this. And for the most part, there won't be, because most of them haven't been rewritten to include those kind of rules. New ones being concluded will, they will include those as results of the BEPS actions. But third, you have to then go and look at what the country has done with the multilateral instrument. <coughs> have they signed up to the multilateral instrument? And <coughs> I think I said how many countries did I say on that, that slide? It was wrong, whatever the number was. <coughs> oh yeah, 90 countries are expected at the meeting. 
I don't know who was expected the meeting. The meeting has now taken place and there were 60 countries there. <coughs> so that's not a great turnout, to be honest. Uh, I'd be quite disappointed for the real party. I was expecting 90 people and 60 turned up. Uh, but there you go. Still quite an awful, lot of, an awful lot of countries that have signed up to this. Um, so 60 countries have, signed, have definitely signed up to that. Uh, these are the countries that at some point will be signing up to the, uh, to the uh, multilateral agreement, you would, you would, multilateral instrument, you would imagine. But you have to then look at the multilateral instrument. You have to decide whether or not the particular jurisdiction that you're dealing with is a signatory to it. And the multilateral instrument isn't just one thing that says everything covering every, every treaty and every uh, provision of that treaty. You can sign the multilateral instrument and you can apply it to whichever of the treaties you've got that you want. So the UK could say, right, we're signing up to the multilateral instrument and we'll apply these clauses. I'm exaggerating a bit, but you, apply, you can apply certain clauses to certain tax treaties and none to some other tax treaties and only these clauses to some other tax treaties. There's not quite as much optionality in it as that, but that's the broad thrust of it. So you have to go through that process to make absolutely sure whether these anti avoidance rules work. What I would do is I'd pretty much assume that in anything we're doing, those anti avoidance rules are there. Because even if they're not there, the case law suggests that a court might pretend they are anyway and might take the view that just by reading this purposively, you come back to the same conclusion. So although you have to go through that hideous process to work out whether, the multi whether there is an anti anti uh, uh, a specific anti avoidance rule or a general anti avoidance rule that could apply to any planning you're doing, just work on the basis it is. Because basically, unless we've got something that commercially stacks up and would be the right side of a principal purpose test, then it may fail anyway. So I'd always think of it in those terms. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great. We have 15 minutes left. So I'm going to give you a quick case study to have a look at. And all I will do with this, uh, you don't have packs of these, do you? So can you all read that? I'll read it out anyway, just... Um, just so that we can go through it and we can decide what we're going to do. Then again, what I'll do is I'll just get everyone, chucking, uh, everyone shouting out answers, shouting out some thoughts. We'll put them on the board. We'll take a picture of the board and we'll let you have that as part of your pack of stuff, yeah? Okay, so it goes like this. I'll just make sure I'm out of the way of the board. Um, a colleague has come to you with an idea to set up a subsidiary in Luxembourg. Uh, we have a representative from Luxembourg in the audience today, which is very helpful. Um, if you've got any particular insight you want to bring to this case study, then please let us know. Um, a colleague has come to you with an idea to set up a subsidiary in Luxembourg which will loan funds to group companies around the world, thus benefiting from reduced withholding tax rates under the double tax treaties in place between Luxembourg and key trading partners across the globe. Even though the corporate income tax rate in Luxembourg is relatively high, most of the income could be transferred into the Cayman, Island, Cayman Islands via further loans and then transferred back to the parent company in Saudi Arabia. Brilliant. The compliance costs will be low. We just need a letterbox company. That's all we need, says your colleague. We just need a letterbox company. Um, uh, what concerns will you share with your colleague regarding, and it's a man because only a man would be this stupid, uh, uh, regarding his proposals? Okay. So over to you guys. Have a think about that for a couple of minutes. I'm just popping out. When I come back, uh, we'll start jotting down a couple of answers about what concerns you might have about that as a proposal and why we might have to worry about it, why the idea might not work, what we'd need to have, make sure is right before we be confident it can work. Okay, I'll leave you for just a minute. Okay, how are we doing? What thoughts have we got? Just five minutes and then we'll be done for slightly early for lunch. What are your concerns about this? What, um, so the colleagues come along to you brimming, uh, brimming full of confidence about this idea, all enthusiastic about this idea of setting up uh, this Luxembourg company. Uh, subsidiary, I think, we're setting it up as. A Luxembourg subsidiary that's going to lend out money and going to receive interest on the loans. And we're getting the benefit of uh, low withholding rate, uh, rate to withholding tax. And we're getting deductions in those different jurisdictions, the interest costs. What's our concerns? Okay, fantastic. So we've gone through this in the previous session. What's the real purpose? What's the principal purpose? Now, just let me just let me just let me say on that. Hang on a sec. Hang on. 
why we bothered about the principal purpose test. I can't find any principal purpose test in the double tax treaty of one of the jurisdictions that we're looking at here. What's the, what's the problem with principal purpose? Why are we worried about that? And I've had a look in the double tax treaty and I've had a look in domestic law and I've actually been really diligent. I've had a look in the multilateral uh, instrument as well. I can't find anything in that. Why are we even bothered about it? Thank you. Uh, that, the answer is purpose of interpretation. The fact that people are even talking about this, the fact that people are, are, uh, are proposing this as possible additions to double tax treaties, you should just assume that's enough to mean it's there, really. So what about this possibly going into double tax treaties? Remember, we're thinking about how a court might regard this. So your example of per principal purpose test is dead right. You do need to worry about what the principal purpose of this is. And even if you can't find a specific anti-avoidance rule or a principal purpose test anti-avoidance rule in the relevant double tax treaties, it doesn't matter. We've still got to worry about it. Great, so that's one. What other what are, what are concerns do we have? There's no substance in the company. Bingo. Dead right. Sorry about that. Um, I'll do that. I was going to. I was going to abbreviate it, then decided not to. I wouldn't. Put something. There we go. Okay. Great. Yes, there is. It's a genuine company. It's been set up. We've got a. Uh, we've got a nice office for it. Uh, we've got some people appointed there, so it's got substance. Yep. <laughs> is that right? Exactly. I mean, you picked up on the right thing. If somebody say, if, if, uh, obviously it's an exaggerated example, but the moment people start using phrases like letterbox company or, dare I say, conduit company, which I was using yesterday, then you've got to ask, uh, come on, you know, have you even thought this through? Um, it's got to be more than the letterbox company. Now, we could actually set it up with some substance. We could set it up with some substance. Maybe some artificiality in setting up with some substance if, we, if we're using the Cayman Islands. And certainly beyond when you're looking at the principal purpose test of that element of it, it'd be really hard, wouldn't it? But straight away, the use of the phrase letterbox company and the lack of substance it jumps off the page, doesn't it? What else have we got? What else are we worried about? Yep. Very good point. And that's a really good example because... That's a really good example because that's, an, that's a domestic law. But you've got, to, you've got to think in every jurisdiction about what the domestic law is. That often gets overlooked because often you're dealing with places that are basically tax havens or they have particularly favourable tax regimes. So people kind of forget about it. Oh, don't worry about BVI, there's no tax in the BVI. Um, and that's probably right. That's probably okay when you're talking about a, 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 you know, a, a genuine tax haven. The moment we're moving into a much more commercial arrangement, with a country that isn't a tax haven, you really have to worry about the domestic rules. So domestic thin cap rules is definitely a point. Yep. Anything else? Let's get a couple more down before we go for lunch. Yeah. We've been through this over and over again. Remember, we only get these treaty benefits. Remember what the treaty said? The beneficial owner of the income. You use the phrase. The double, all the double tax treaties use the phrase. The beneficial owner of the royalties. The beneficial owner of the dividend. The beneficial owner. Of the, um, of, the, of the interest. Um, so if there isn't somebody who's the beneficial owner, and we all know what that means, it's more than just legally receiving it, if there isn't somebody who's the beneficial owner, then we shouldn't be within the benefits of the tax treaty. I'm sorry, throughout the, throughout the notes on this presentation, beneficial ownership is abbreviated to BO, and uh, the non-English speakers may not know this, but BO is a normal abbreviation for body odour. Uh, so I try to avoid saying BO uh, as I've gone through this. Um, so beneficial ownership, I will stick to the longer term if you don't mind. Uh, so beneficial ownership is a very good one. Any, anything else? Um, aside from the substance in the Okay. 
Anything else? What else have we got? Yep. Love it. Anything else? I'll tell you what, I'll chuck in a final one. We could, we could stand it all day writing our concerns about this because there are, th there are lots of them, but lucky seven, just put general anti avoidance. What gars or other rules do we have in either of the any of the local uh, jurisdictions, and what can we, what can we implicitly read into the application of laws to this arrangement once a court gets to look at this, bearing in mind that it can be looking at the treaties purposively? So, can we infer the existence of a general anti-abuse rule in the treaties in any of the treaties anyway, just because they're in the pipeline? Because that's where the, the way the wind's blowing, and. Simple. These are all the concerns you'll share with your colleague. You have lots of other concerns you'd share with your colleague. That doesn't mean that's the end of it, but you've got to make sure that you can go down this list and tick every one of these concerns and make sure they're properly addressed before you can be seriously looking at putting anything in place. And if you can get to a point where you've actually addressed all those concerns and they are, uh, they are adequately covered, then yeah, you might have something because you might be able to identify this in terms of the benefits of the Luxembourg subsidiary. You might be able to identify these genuine benefits in terms of some of the jurisdictions with which, uh, to which you're lending. And the use of a finance company, the use of a company that is lending, absolutely fine, that might still work. But you see, in going through that process and in eliminating all of these, you might decide that, you know, um, Cayman is not the place where you want, to, uh, uh, that you want to be using as a kind of money box company. You might decide that Luxembourg isn't, uh, forgive me, isn't actually the ideal place to have the company that's going to be the finance company. You might decide that you need to have a different approach, but you need to be addressing all these concerns before you can go on with it. And that's all that session was about. It was just saying, look, there are mountains of anti-avoidance rules that already exist. There are lots of things in legislation that are intended to limit the way in which you can plan. But that's only one side of the story. Remember, that's balanced against the fact that anyone can, company, individual, anyone, under normal principles, normal legal principles that apply in most parts of the world, you are entitled to arrange your affairs in a way that means that you don't necessarily pay the highest amount of tax. You don't have to voluntarily go along to any government and say, here's, here's the tax that I've been paying, plus actually I've done this, so here's a lot more. You don't have to do that. That's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is, obviously, successive governments in any jurisdiction and international organisations will try harder and harder and harder to put rules in the way. But just be aware of the limitation of those rules. Because you've got on the one extreme, the very general law that catches everything, my stuff example, but is almost certainly unenforceable. Or at the other end, you've got something that really is specific and narrow and doesn't catch much, but is very enforceable. And there isn't really a... There isn't really a catch-all. There isn't really a way that any government, any treaty, any set of legislation can just magically say you can't improve your tax position. You can't avoid tax if I have to use the phrase. Uh, so that's really the state of play at the moment. Just be aware. I mean, I've got to say, where is this going to go? I'm not sure it can go much further than what we've already got because I think you've got to the limit now, uh, I believe, of where... Um, people are recognising that tax, like other law, needs to be read purposively. Uh, and that's pretty much as far as I think it can go. I think um, uh, beyond that, actually somehow trying to force people into taking a higher tax route is impossible. Um, I, well, touch wood, it's impossible. I can't see how realistically anybody will try to do that. Okay, that's us done.